Welcome to FOB TV, the future of business. I'm Kevin Benedict, the host. And I want to introduce you again to our returning guest, Rob Tiffany. And Rob is the vice president and head of IoT strategy at Ericsson. He's also the executive director at Moab Foundation, which we'll talk about here in a little bit more. This is part two of this interview, and we're going to have a lot of fun here. We're going to jump right into it, Rob. Rob, we talked a lot about everything in part one, but we were leading up and you were giving us the kind of the background and the importance of 5G. Let's jump right into it in this part two. And let me just ask you this, what's the impact consumers are going to experience from 5G in 2021, 2022? Yeah, well, as they start to get handsets, and I would say 2020 was a great year for devices coming up of handsets because Qualcomm really kicked it into gear. And so I think, you know, right out of the gate, you saw a lot of the manufacturers and obviously Samsung just really went all in. Uh, and then towards the end of the year, you got the new iPhone 12. And, and that's what we needed, right? Back to that whole chicken and the egg thing. And I think, gosh, I, I was reading stats. I don't, I think they sold 80 million iPhones or something like that. Like they went back into the pole position again. Wow. Usually they're, usually they're getting beat by Samsung. Um, yeah. And so uh, it's interesting. And so people are excited, it, you know, kind of like there's this, that wave, there's obviously a 5G yeah. wave and people care about it. Okay. So why does the consumer care? Faster cat videos, which are so important. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. Fast cat. Fast cat. Um, <laughs> yeah. That capacity we talked about back in part one of our talk besides IOT, even though you can have fast capacity, you know, if there's too many of all of you all on the network at the same time, it still is going to slow you down. You just can't get around that. Yeah. So a lot of those slowdowns that you didn't know why, like, have you ever been near a cell tower and you have like four bars of LTE or 5G and yet it's still kind of creeping? Oh along? yeah. Go to a college football game. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And you're like, what the heck? So that extra capacity is going to help all of us consumers too, because, but you know how it is, like how people only complain when something's wrong, but when you're doing things right, they never say anything. Oh yeah. That's oh, how yeah. this is going to be. No one's going to say anything because they're going to expect it to yeah. work. Right. And so, uh, and so, yeah, so all of a sudden you're just not going to see these slowdowns and we're going to have all these people and you, you hit it right on the head. When we start going back to football games again, and baseball games and big sporting events where you have all these people all connected simultaneously where you would see slowdowns. Yeah. You know, Verizon has gone all in and I, they had no idea that their timing might've been off. They didn't yeah. know that we weren't going to be in stadiums for the NFL this last year, but they had pre-wired most, I think some or all the NFL stadiums with millimeter wave. Cause that's kind of how Verizon went all in on that side yeah. of the spectrum. Whereas, you know, T-Mobile went in on the other side first. And so to really show off, Hey, this is what 5g can do. Right. And so, uh, I, so I think once we start getting back and hopefully, you know, people start getting this vaccine and we head in towards summer and maybe things will loosen up. And so people can get back into stadiums or ballparks. Um, and you just won't notice that problem anymore. Lots of, because a lot of stadiums spend a lot of money uh, putting Wi-Fi everywhere. Right. Um, or you would sometimes see emergency portable cell towers being brought in, you know, that are yeah. mobile uh, to, to give that extra capacity. And so, uh, so I think it's going to be great for consumers, but they, they'll just expect it and it'll be awesome. All right. So for businesses, uh, let's just talk about small to medium sized businesses. How might 5G help them? It gives you options. And I'm going to say this will flow from consumers yes. at home and small and medium business. A lot of times when you think about the importance of connectivity for your business, you know, and so you might be using fiber or MPLS or cable modems. And a lot of companies are out there with really fast speeds on cable modems, you know, Comcast, you will now have this extra option, which is called fixed wireless. It's not like that's totally new. That's been possible with LTE, but it's a big part of 5G. And so there's a lot of places that need connectivity and maybe they don't have fiber going to where that person's located or that little small business located, but you're gonna see 5G being beamed directly at those places. Because the other part of this, this is so geeky, antenna geek stuff, beam forming yeah. and stuff like that, yeah. that's a thing. No one needs to know why it works, it's just plumbing, but it does. And so all of a sudden, I think we'll start seeing options for small, medium businesses and homes to say, oh, 
well, hey, I could get one gigabit, you know, with this fixed wireless access technology from a particular mobile operator or other companies may pop up to do that. You know how there's that whole MVNO thing where the other companies are kind oh, yeah. of piggybacking? I wouldn't be surprised to see that happening. I know I've, a lot of stuff around this in Australia, for instance, uh, I think the government's kind of pushing it because any place where you have lots of land, they need to get stuff to people. And and this is this totally goes into another conversation we can have right. just about rural America, actually. Oh, yeah. Uh, but I need to get broadband to a place and I haven't, I'm not going to spend the money to run fiber to that deal, but maybe that, that fixed wireless access is going to be there. And so I think it's going to be an option for a lot of small businesses. Everybody needs connectivity. Yep. So, um, and so it'll, it'll be about pricing and performance, that kind of thing, reliability. Which industries are going to be the early adopters? That's a good point. I think manufacturing. And the reason for that is something we haven't talked about yet. So there's there's so many different facets of 5G. There's also yeah. this weird stuff called network slicing where you can carve off parts and networks that are beaming and give them quality of service and different speeds. Uh -huh. But there's also this idea of private 5G. So right now today to do wireless inside a building, you probably got a bunch of Wi-Fi access points everywhere. That's pretty typical. Uh, and Cisco has loved you for that. Yes. And everybody, right? All of a sudden now there's this other option and it's because of two things. It's this capability of 5G, this new private gear that looks really friendly to an IT person. And like Ericsson has these things, they're called radio dots. It literally looks like a smoke detector. And you just kind of plug it up. Think about every major company you know, whether it's in a skyscraper, a distribution center, a warehouse, a factory, they already have ethernet, cat five, cat six ethernet going yeah. through, the, through the walls everywhere. And you have the ethernet yep. drops. And those drops were typically where you would plug in a Wi-Fi access point. So now imagine unplugging the Wi-Fi access point and plugging in a 5G there instead. So now you can have 5G inside the building and have that roaming characteristics as you flow through the building that will blow your mind. Um, we kind of been trying to do that as you're walking around with your laptop and yeah. exposed, but it doesn't do it very well. So imagine crazy 5G speeds reliability. And so manufacturers are already kicking the tires on that right now. Lots of them are actually. Uh, so the other part of that, and we may have talked about this before, is this thing called CBRS. Yeah. Which is this, sounds like citizens band radio to me, Breaker 1-9. And so that's a deal where the government is saying, we're going to carve off this much spectrum for companies or municipalities or whoever. It doesn't have to be a typical mobile operator spending billions in an auction. We're going to make yeah. it reasonable. And so a big company can say, we're going to do 5G for our corporate campus, for instance, maybe in Boise. Oh, and wow. so wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> and yeah. so all of a sudden you're going to walk through and you're going to have 5G everywhere inside the building. Now, what has to change there? 5G endpoints. So we got phones, but we're going to need some laptops with 5G. And so just like, do you remember the earliest days before Wi-Fi was automatically built into your laptop? I, this is a long time ago, folks. Oh, yeah. Remember you had a PCMCIA card? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. I had them. Yes. Yes. So we used to put a card in to get Wi-Fi. That was a thing, kids. Sorry. Yeah. Kids. This is your uncle, granddad, <laughs> Rob here. And uh, and so uh, that, that was the thing. And But Intel did something called Centrino back in the early 2000s, where they fused together Wi-Fi with their CPU chips and put them in laptops. And that really moved the needle and got all of a sudden Wi-Fi adoption became huge. And then every yeah. company did it. Well, Qualcomm, is working on the same thing right now. They're working on the idea of 5G laptops and to try to kind of do that same kind of thing we saw Intel do 20 years ago. Wow. So won't happen overnight. Again, yes. it's a chicken and the egg thing, new laptops with 5G in it. Yeah. Uh, and it's a little different because there's always that notion, oh, do I have to get a plan? You know, do I have to, you know, that kind of thing. So yes. that'll have to, but all of a sudden you can roam around your corporate campus with the laptop. Uh, and then the idea of just 5G endpoints. And so, the Ericsson technology that does this, the, the other part of it is security. Um, so great roaming, super speed, awesomeness everywhere, 5G endpoints, 5G sensors, you know, cellular basically instead of Wi-Fi or whatever. You know how you use a SIM card in your yeah. phone and that's part of your identity and it also creates security. It's an encrypted thing. So yep. part of the gear you get is you actually get a SIM writer when you buy all this gear. And so this, you will write your own SIM cards to put into your 5G 
endpoints for IoT, for instance, or whatever inside your company. And so what that means is it's a whole new level of security. Nobody gets on that network unless they have one of these SIM cards that you or your company created. Uh-huh. And so it, it's a great way to lock down that network. You know, gosh, we could talk for hours about cyber warfare going on outside the internet oh, just yeah. right now. Oh, yeah. On the, yeah, it's out of control. <clears throat> and so people are super paranoid about that and they should be. And so this is a great way to lock things down is, is having your own encrypted networks with your own SIM cards. Uh, hey, so let me ask, as we're talking about all these endpoints and everything, so yeah. Ericsson recently purchased the Boise company Cradlepoint. Yes. Where does that fit into the whole mix? I think it's it, it's more of an enterprise play, you know. So Ericsson really only sells gear to mobile operators. We don't typically talk directly to enterprises like Verizon or at and in customer. Right. We have solutions for those customers, and Cradle Point's part of that. But we would always go through them. But the Cradle Point is they're known for bringing cellular and wireless out to places where you can't find it or into places. You know, they have they've always had those yeah. routers a zillion years ago when I was at Microsoft doing when we were enterprise mobile people, you know, we I remember Cradle Point was going out there and bringing connectivity out to construction sites right. and all that kind of stuff. And and it was like, and of course, it's probably in every police car in America is some kind of cradle point gear because those guys need that connectivity. Oh yeah. So it's a different, it's a more enterprise focused slant on delivering LTE and 5G to places where enterprises need them. Um, but also if you look at, if you go on their website, look at some of the gear they make, these, these edge routers for yeah. Wi-Fi, but they're also like a little edge gateway router. Like when we think about edge computing and IoT Yeah, and they are capable of running containers there. And so you can absolutely push IoT edge agents out there running in containers to do that edge analytics and everything. Cradle Point kind of has that one, two punch. Are there other edge hardware gear players? Absolutely, Dell makes some HP, yeah. Tech makes some, uh, but Cradle Point has them, except it has big honking crazy looking antennas too. Yes. That's, that's delivering LTE yeah. and 5G to these places. And so uh, I'm excited about the Cradle Point thing. Uh, oh, that's it's, awesome. it, it's a great group of folks too, most importantly. Awesome. Well, you're going to have to come out and visit Boise. I can hardly wait. All right. So last question here, part of your uh, title talks about you being the executive director at the Moab Foundation. You and I have talked about this behind the scenes offline, but share with the audience about Moab and what your mission is. Yeah, absolutely. So as this character actually knows from a long time ago, there was this period of time after Hitachi and Lumada but before Ericsson, where I was doing this startup called Enterprise IoT. And I was building this enterprise class IoT digital twin platform. Yes. And I called it Moab after that beautiful place in Utah yeah. uh, with amazing national parks around there. I built this technology and then I, I joined Ericsson. It was on the shelf for a while. Um, yep. but, I re- but I revisited it and I was like, you know what? Over time, you know, we all kind of have a personal journey. I yes. started finding myself thinking and being involved in panel discussions and writing stuff about why can't we use this IoT technology for helping society, for hunger, for water issues, for climate, yeah. whatever it is. And so I started going down that path and I was like, you know what? I built this thing that's sitting around and let's use it. Um, so I started upgrading this Moab platform and uh, actually I've really been stripping out functionality to make it less complex. I want it to be simple for anybody. And so uh, I wrapped, uh, the idea was, all right, I wrapped a foundation around this. So I created a nonprofit uh, called the Moab Foundation based on that previous name from the thing. Yeah. And then um, with the thinking, I'm going to open source this stuff. I'm going to give it to nonprofits or NGOs, you know, non-government organizations to, to, who are out there on the front lines trying to help out all kinds of different things. Um, oh, yeah. Along the way, I learned about the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Yeah. If for no other reason, it was a great way for my dumb brain to categorize things. Yeah. You know, people, it's kind of a cliche. They always say the technology is the easy part, you know, yeah. it's this other stuff. It's, it's so true. So what the goal is, is let's just, we're going to mash some things together. We've got 17 sustainable goals to categorize things. 
per each goal, we will come up with appropriate use cases. IoT is not made for everything. We're not going to pound a square peg in a round hole if it doesn't make right. sense. But uh, we'll come up with a use case where IoT can kind of move the needle and make a difference. Because uh, this whole this whole sustainable development goal thing, there's a deadline called 2030. Yeah. So we're like in the last decade to try to make some of these things happen. Come up with a use case, write out what's the game plan. How would someone go to market? How would someone go do this? And then of course it takes volunteers. This is like volunteering to go to work out in some village or go to some part of the world, you know, where you're right. on a mission, you're on a mission and you're out there to do some good for some people. And then along the way, I'm going to hand you this Moab technology and no, it doesn't have to be this giant, big mega IOT thing that has to run in the cloud. I made it super efficient and lightweight. It can run on a little tiny economical device mm -hmm. um, and it's portable. You know, Cause you got to imagine if the mantra is about sustainability and using fewer resources and energy and all that kind of stuff, everything about it has to kind of walk the talk, right? Yep. And so the platform itself is lightweight and the roadmap is to make it even lighter weight. So changes over like over the Christmas holidays, I upgraded it to some newer, the new .NET 5, which is even faster and lighter weight than before. Yeah. So it's super efficient, doesn't use a lot of memory. Because I, if I need to go out into a village in Africa and power the thing by solar with a battery, then that's right. what you got to do. Because we, we already talk about that because there's always, the, there's the sensor part. Like if, yeah. if I'm going after hunger and poverty at sustainable development goals, well, the thing that both of them have in common is agriculture. Turns yeah. out the most people who are in extreme poverty also work in agriculture and yeah. they're all hungry. We have a population explosion, you may have noticed. Yeah. And we have to feed more people with the same amount of land and everything. Since precision farming, agriculture, how can we go help those folks? But guess what? Those folks are out there trying to help the world. They're a little strapped for cash. <laughs> that, absolutely. <laughs> they don't have a lot of money. That's kind of, that's what this whole thing is about. It's like, it's just give, give, give. So here's the ideas. Here's the plan. Here's some, I'm trying to make it as low cost or free as I can. Yeah. Um, you know, we'll do donations for the hardware part or whatever oh, network, yeah. stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, that's the kind of the game plan. That's, and, uh, that's brilliant, Rob. So if somebody wanted to read up more on this, where would they go? Go to moabfoundation.org. Moabfoundation.org. O-R-G. Yes, O-R-G. <laughs> that's brilliant. Rob, thank you for uh, taking the time out of your busy schedule to talk to us and share your insights. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's been great talking to you.